Hello, I'm Katie Jarvis. This week, Real Foot Forward is made possible by our friends at Final Flight Outfitters, the family-owned outdoor store that has all the apparel and outdoor equipment you need for your next hunting or fishing trip. Visit finalflight.net for more information. Welcome to Real Foot Forward from Discovery Park of America, located up here in the corner of beautiful West Tennessee. Every day at our museum and heritage park, we inspire children and adults to see beyond. And each week, we do the same thing here on our podcast. Today's guest is someone who has been here at Discovery Park since the beginning. She tells me stories of how she remembers planning the groundbreaking event for Discovery Park and how she and the team worked in trailers as they watched Discovery Park of America slowly but surely rise out of a cornfield in Union City, Tennessee. And later, join us as we discover something new here at Discovery Park of America. I'm Katie Jarvis, stand-in host for Scott Williams on Real Foot Forward, where each week we celebrate our little corner of West Tennessee and focus on the culture, the spirit, the accomplishments, and the history of West Tennessee just like we do here at our museum and heritage park every day. Today's guest is someone who has been here at Discovery Park since the beginning. She has a story to tell, so Mary Nita Bondurant, thank you for being a part of the podcast today. Thank you for having me, Katie. Well, let's just get to know you a little bit. Who is Mary Nita Bondurant? Well, I'm a small town girl from Princeton, Kentucky, born and raised there. I then attended Western Kentucky University in Bowling Green and got my degree in communications and met my husband, Jim Bondurant. I've been married to him now for 42 years. He found a business, a small taxidermy business in Union City and asked me to move here with him. And I did. So it's really unusual for a couple to move to Union City, Tennessee like that. I mean, most people are either from here or they've married somebody from here. But we just moved here. We didn't know a soul. We moved here in 1979 and found that it was a great little town to raise our family. And um, I've had various and sundry jobs throughout the years, but I love the one I have now at Discovery Park. So tell us what you have done. Well, when Jimbo and I moved here in 1979, I went to work at the Fulton Daily Leader. It was a a daily newspaper at that time. I've always been in sales and marketing. All of my jobs have been in sales or marketing. And um, I did that for several years. I had my children, Dylan and Katie. And when they started school, I needed to work in Union City. So I moved over to radio. I worked at WENK and KF99 for about five years while they were little and going to preschool and early in their little elementary school years. And then um, when they started middle school, I kind of felt like I needed to to hit the career trail a little bit more. I went to work for Baptist Healthcare System, and I marketed their workers' comp plan to industry around the area. And when I left there, I went to West Tennessee Healthcare in Jackson, and I learned the health insurance from the inside out. It was a third-party administrator, and so that was a great training ground for what I consider the majority of my career when I landed at Union City Insurance. And I was an employee group health insurance and employee benefits specialist for 13 years. Wow. And then you ended up at Discovery Park. So how did you end up here? Well, my boss at Union City Insurance was Jim Rippey, and he was best friends with Robert Kirkland. And so when Robert Kirkland had this idea to build something like Discovery Park here in Union City, he asked Jim Rippey to help him make it happen. So the whole time I was working with Jim Rippey, or for a lot of years while I was working at Union City Insurance, Jim was also involved in the building of Discovery Park. And at one point, he asked me if I would serve as the chairman of the marketing committee, which I was glad to do. So I was kind of in on the ground floor. When Jim left Union City Insurance to come to Discovery Park as a CEO, he asked if I would join him and be the marketing director. And it was kind of a hard decision because I had a really great uh, job at Union City Insurance. I loved it. 
um, I was going to take a pretty big pay cut to come to work out here. (laughs) But uh, the big picture, my kids were grown, our house was paid for, and I decided that I wanted to be, I wanted to continue to be involved with Discovery Park. I liked the fact that it was a nonprofit, that we had a, a mission to educate people, inspire people. And so I made the move and I've been here since the beginning. Wow. So tell us about the beginnings. Because at first I said, you know, you've shared stories with me about being in a trailer. And so because I joined the team after everything was pretty and all done. So tell us about being in a trailer and the first groundbreaking. Okay, so I gave my resignation to Union City Insurance in December of 2012. And then I came to work at Discovery Park in February the 1st. I took a little month off. I uh, came to work at Discovery Park on February 1st of 2013. And we were in a trailer out in the back quarter of the grounds. And it was a gravel trailer. We had a gravel road to get down there. It was just like a, it, there was nothing fancy about it at all. But fortunately, I did have a window. And I could look out my window and watch the construction of Discovery Park. I watched them bring the PT steermen in. I watched as they put it through the roof and into the military gallery. Um, it, it was just fascinating to watch the completion of Discovery Park. Wow. And then how many people were in the trailer? I'm just curious about this. Okay. When I started, there was Jim Rippey and Polly um, Brasher was already on board. She was a volunteer through most of the project. And so she was in the trailer with Jim Rippey. And I'm trying to think if there were any other Discovery Park employees. I was really one of the first four or five for sure. Jennifer may have already been working on the um, at the Obion County Museum in the artifact part of it, but I wasn't really exposed to her because she was not on site that much. And then, of course, the contractors were also in the trailer. So um, that when I started, I can only remember really Jim and Polly and Chris Gunnelfinger. Polly already had an assistant and her assistant, Chris Gunnelfinger, was in the other trailer. And then I was the first one in the trailer where I was. I shared it with Maltby and that was the exhibit builder company. And then shortly thereafter, we added John Watkins, the grounds director, um, Lauren Sims, the gift shop manager, Casey, the aquarium, Casey King, the aquarium manager. So the team just started growing at that point. And tell me about these employees, because are they still here? It's like a close-knit community almost. It is, Katie. That's a great question, because... You know, I'm 62 years old, and so occasionally I think about retiring, and when I think about retiring, I almost always get choked (laughs) (laughs) because there's an emotional attachment here, and I think probably that's the same way for a lot of the team. Yeah. (laughs) Well, tell us about, did you ever see Mr. Kirkland? Oh, my goodness, yes. (laughs) He was around all the time. Mr. Kirkland was very involved in the details of Discovery Park. I remember one day when he came in and, and they had been painting the chapel and it looked beautiful. All of us thought it was just gorgeous. And there was a little wooden area above a window on a door. And Mr. Kirkland said that it wasn't the right color, white. He wanted it to be a little different color yeah. white. So he was very involved in, in a lot of the decisions here, both big decisions and small decisions. And so was he nice to work with or kind of tell us about his personality a little bit? Well, to do that, I'll tell you a little bit about mine. Okay. I'm real comfortable with almost everybody. I feel like I could talk to the president of the United States. I can, you know, I'm really just comfortable with people. I was a little intimidated by Robert Kirkland for some reason. I felt like when I was in his presence that I was in the presence of somebody special, Mm -hmm. really great, and a little intimidating to me. I don't know why. Yeah. Well, he has left us a great gem here in Union City, Tennessee, and really for the world to discover and just to be inspired to see beyond here at Discovery Park of America. He certainly has. uh, Robert and his wife, Jenny, gave this community and this region and this state and this United States, a really special gift with Discovery Park of America. There, It could be in any city, in any metropolitan area, and it would be iconic to that area. If Discovery Park were in Atlanta, people would talk about wanting to go to Atlanta to Discovery Park. So it's just really, really great that it's here in Union City. So let's talk about the location and tourism in general. What do you think Union City has here besides Discovery Park 
that tourists would want to come and experience, whether it's Union City or O'Brien County or just Northwest Tennessee. Well, you know, Katie, a few times we've been fortunate enough to have the American Queen or the American Princess visit us. And when those boats dock in Hickman and they bring those folks over to Discovery Park, it's really fascinating because they are here from all over the United States. And the first thing they say when they get off the bus is, what in the world did I see driving from Hickman to Union City? Yep. And we're like, well, you were seeing corn and soybeans and, <laughs> and they, cotton. And cotton. <laughs> and they didn't even recognize what it was. So we're in a real rural agricultural area. The landscape is beautiful. We're 23 miles from Real Foot Lake, which is a very unique and unusual lake and something that tourists would come for miles and miles and miles to see, even if they couldn't come here too. We have a little community that has some pretty quirky and neat little stores and restaurants. And I think you've even written a blog for the Discovery Park website that tells people different little places that they can go eat and little shops that they can go see when they're here. And all of those things are just so different from a city experience, Mm -hmm. but so much fun. And I think that that's what people and guests are looking for is something off the beaten path that you can't find in the big city. I think that most tourists are kind of finding their way to these little unique small towns of Tennessee and really just America. I think it happens more and more. We're really close to Kentucky Lake and Paris Landing. We're really close to Jackson, Tennessee and Paducah, Kentucky, and they both have their own special unique things to do and places to visit. It's my understanding that Patty's in Grand Rivers is being rebuilt, and it's a wonderful uh, historic kind of restaurant that people come for, for hours, actually, to visit. So we're close to Patty's in Grand Rivers. We're just, it's a real cool little place in the United States for people to visit. And we're on the way somewhere. Right, right. We're on your way from St. Louis to Memphis or from Chicago to Memphis or even down to the beach. So it's a great stopping point. And we have two new hotels right next door. I know. And I think that that's going to bring even more people and they're going to find even more things to explore. And then I think other people in this area, you know, one time, once upon a time, Katie, Branson was just one building with a stage and look at it now. Mm -hmm. And so that same thing can happen here in Union City when people decide that they want to also capitalize on the 250,000 guests that are coming in to see Discovery Park and start building campgrounds and other things for people to do. I think it's just going to grow in this area. And so that leads me to my next question. What do you think Union City, O'Bion County, this area will look like in about 10 years? I hope that it looks like like a Branson or a Gatlinburg or Pigeon Forge, not a major metropolitan area. I don't think that's probably going to happen here, but more of a tourist destination where people can come here for two, three, four nights and have plenty of plenty of things to do and see and experience. Absolutely. Because of the hotels, I think that's a great point for guests and families to come and experience because it's right next door to Discovery Park. We've got the cute little quaint downtown Union City with all these little local dives and diners. And then we've got White Squirrel Winery just about 16 miles from Discovery Park. We've got a distillery in Trimble, Tennessee, that's home of Michael Ballard, right? That's right. <laughs> he, he does the big Sturgis. The, Sturgis, <laughs> the motorcycle guy. Yeah. I mean, there's just so much to see and do in this Northwest Tennessee corner. And a lot of people haven't heard about it quite yet, but we're getting the word out there. That's right. That's our job. That's what we do every day. So uh, for six years, I've been here on the marketing and directing the marketing department. And I have great people that I'll get to work with every day. And we have a lot of challenges because we are bringing, trying to bring lots of people into a community. And Union City only has 10,500 citizens living here. So we're, uh, we work real hard. We take a lot of different approaches to trying to, to trying to let folks know about Discovery Park. Speaking of working at Discovery Park, what makes it a unique place? Either one or two little tidbits of why Discovery Park is a unique place to work. Well, as our new CEO, Scott Williams, likes to say, this is a quirky museum. It's not like going into any other museum that you've ever visited anywhere before. Instead of being thought out by a museum design company and then built, Robert Kirkland organized 250 volunteers from Union City who worked and created the vision for Discovery Park, and then he hired 
the museum companies, world-class museum companies, uh, exhibit designers, and and think the people that develop the content to make those dreams become a reality. So it's just, to me, there's just nothing else like it. I think it's beautiful. Every morning when I pull up to work and I look at the water feature and I see the architecture of the building and I see how beautiful the grounds are and I walk in through dinosaurs and geodes and fossils and I mean, there's just there's just nothing else like it. Right. And as one of our friends from Tennessee Tourism described it, it's like a phoenix rising out of the Mississippi Delta. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) So if somebody wants to pursue a career in marketing and advertising, what's a piece of advice that you would give to them if they're fresh out of college? Well, you know, most of my career was in sales and I love sales. I'm a people person. I like to be around people. And mostly it's about relationships and about always doing the best thing that you can do for your customer. And then I think success just follows that. And your customers are external and they're internal. It's the people you work with as well as the people you're working for. And I think as long as you're just doing the best you can do every day and you take it seriously and you're committed, that success will follow. So, Mary Nito, what are some of the highlights of your career while being here at Discovery Park of America? Great question, Katie. I'd have to say that opening day, November 1st of 2013, that was just such an awesome day. And, of course, as the marketing department, um, we were responsible for having all the people here. So I was thrilled that Governor Bill Haslam came out that day. We had tons of local, state, regional dignitaries here. And then we just had so many people that came out of just curiosity or just because they were so excited that Discovery Park was opening. So we had thousands of people here. It was a great day. Had the governor here. Robert Kirkland and Jenny Kirkland cut that ribbon. It there, it was awesome. That was one of my favorite days at Discovery Park. And then also, one day, we were really wanting some national publicity really, really bad. And we got a phone call from the state of Tennessee PR director, Cindy Dupree. And she said that Al Roker was going to stop by as he was broadcasting the weather. Oh, that was during Rokerthon. That's right. Uh huh. So he was going to all 50 states, and we were thrilled that Discovery Park was one of his stops. And we did make it on national TV that day, just Ooh. a little glimpse of Discovery Center, a little foggy in the background right at the end of the show, but we did make it. And then I have one more thing that I, I'd love to mention. One of the things I love about working here is the, that I've had the opportunity to work with some great people. So when I started, especially young people, because, you know, I've been around the block Mm -hmm. a few years. And so uh, when I first came to work here, I had an intern. Her name was Abby. And I loved working with Abby and then Hannah. And then, of course, you, Katie, (laughs) Carly, Jessica, both Lawrence. It's just wonderful to get to be around young people. You guys keep me young. And hopefully I can share some of the lessons that I've gleaned through my many years of experience. And so I really love that aspect of my job as well. And that is so sweet of you because I have learned a ton and continue to learn a ton. And I know that the other young people here, they do turn to you and the senior leadership here at Discovery Park. And we're going to take some of this advice and take it to our careers. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Andrew Gibson here with the Education Department at Discovery Park of America. And today I am with Nathaniel Newland, a docent here who will be sharing a story that you are sure to find fascinating. I know I sure did when I first heard about it. And we're going to be talking about the Naga tribe. Is that correct? Yes, it is. All right. So um, where, first off, where can you find uh, information about the Naga tribe here at Discovery Park? In the Enlightenment Gallery, we have several artifacts that Mr. Kirkland himself brought back uh, from one of his trips to that region. And what exactly is that region or where is that region? Northeastern India. Uh, So there are about 90 tribes that identify as Naga today. Uh, Most of them live in Northeastern India in that part that's separated from the majority of India by that tiny little corridor over Bangladesh. Uh, There are a few tribes that reside in northern Myanmar, but for the overwhelming majority live in northeastern India. So we we talked about where the Naga um, are from, but where does the term Naga come from? 
interesting note on that. There are actually two groups in India called Naga, and they have a completely different origin. Uh, so we're talking about the Naga in the northeastern part of India. They get their name from the Burmese word Naga, which just means people with earrings. The other group of Naga live in southern India and get their name from the Sanskrit word Naga, which means snake, since they worship uh, a group of snake demigods known as the Naga. Fun fact there, a female Naga is called a Nagini, which is where that uh, Harry Potter character comes from. And so what artifacts do we have on display here at the park? We have a couple of headhunters belts, uh, a feast of merit wall panel, and a Naga bed that's carved out of a single piece of wood. Can you talk to us more about the headhunter belts and the significance and, mm -hmm. and, and what those are exactly? So as I said earlier, there are about 90 different tribes that identify as Naga today. And for the majority of their history, up until the late 1800s or so, uh, they were pretty much all in a constant state of war with each other. Each village really was its own republic, and there was really no diplomacy between them. And so collectively, most of the tribes participated in headhunting, which was how the men in the village gained honor and prestige. So the man who could uh, claim the most skulls of his enemies, or not even necessarily his enemies, just anyone that crosses his path, if he were to take that person's skull, it was seen as stealing their soul, basically. Um, so the act of beheading was accomplished with the use of a specialized machete called a dao, sometimes called an axe, but really more of a machete. And we have two of the belts that would hold those machetes. So which, which tribe are you talking about? Are you talking about the earrings or are we talking about the snakes? Earrings. Earrings. The people with earrings. Okay. Would you like to know how they got that name? <laughs> yeah. So that's really the next stage of their history. Uh, so they were really isolated for about 700 years up in the hills, of the foothills on the, of the Himalayas, pretty much just warring against each other. And then like the rest of the world, the British showed up and the British had already taken control. The British East India Company, that is, had already taken, taken control of uh, the rest of the Indian subcontinent, basically. So all of India, all of... Uh, Burma, which is now Myanmar, Bangladesh, Pakistan. Uh, and really the only thing holding them back was this one little region in the foothills of the Himalayas where the Naga were. And so they asked their Burmese guides who lives up there. And the Burmese said the Naga or the people with earrings. Uh, and the Burmese pretty much said, don't go up there. <laughs> they will mess you up. Uh, and the British being very confident did not heed that advice and uh, took a number of unsuccessful expeditions uh, into the foothills to try to conquer the Naga. The The name of the Naga tribe, did they call themselves that or did they self-identify as the Naga people or was that just a name given to them by the Burmese? So like I said, each tribe was really its own republic and so they didn't have a collective term for themselves for most of their history. They would have referred to themselves by their individual names. For example, one was the Kayuk and one was the Askima and things of that sort. Um, and, the, and what was the second artifact you, you mentioned we have on display here, a panel? The Feast of Merit wall panel. Uh, and go into details about that. Okay. So uh, a more humane way to gain honor and prestige in your village than uh, beheading all of your enemies uh, would be to hold a Feast of Merit, which is basically, it has to be performed by a couple. Can't A single person can't do it. Uh, so a couple would basically save up their entire life uh, save all of their belongings, all of their wealth. And when they thought they were at a place where they could finally host a festival for their entire village, they would do so. And the festival would only be signaled to end when they ran out of money. So basically use up everything you have to throw this extravagant feast for everyone in your village. And afterwards, you've lost your riches, but you've gained respect. And if you're able to do four of these feasts, so save and lose, save and lose, save and lose, save and lose, then you would basically be assured a place in eternity. And after the fourth feast, you would be allowed to put uh, basically these cow heads on your house. And they didn't have to be literal cow heads. It could just be images, which is what we have here. It's a wall panel. And if you look at it, you can kind of make out uh, carved cow heads with the horns coming out. And at the very top, you see all the little faces of all the happy villagers. <laughs> All right, and then, then the third thing you mentioned was the bed, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, and so what's the significance of the Naga bed? So the 
big significance is it's carved out of one piece of wood, uh, which if you've ever carved wood, you can appreciate that <laughs> because it takes a while. Um, and since you put so much, they put so much effort into each individual bed, they probably wouldn't have just used it for a bed. If it was kind of multi-purposed. Uh, for example, most of them use them as grain tables too, so that they might may have had two holes cut in it where they would sort good grain, bad grain, then have baskets underneath to catch. So you could sort out and clean your grain. The ones we have here, I had to crawl under it to tell, but uh, it does not have the holes in it, but it still probably would have been used for something other than just a bed. Gotcha. Uh, so thank you all for listening to the podcast today. Um, you can come to Discovery Park of America and see the artifacts we have on the Naga tribe here in the Enlightenment Gallery. Uh, so once again, thank you all for listening to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast, and we hope to see you here at Discovery Park of America real soon. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. If you enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on iTunes or wherever you may be listening. Plan your own adventure to see beyond at Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. Be sure to also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.